Okay, the game is Conquistador. Um, and as you can see, I have the Avalon Hill version, not the SPI version. However, just to make things really complicated, I lost my Avalon Hill rules at some point. And my friend Bart happened to have a copy of the SPI one, which I, I'm lucky because he tends to sell a lot of his games and he's probably gotten rid of it by now. Uh, and I was able to photocopy that or maybe he did it for me. Anyway, <coughs> it meant I had a copy of the rules. I have a similar situation uh, with uh, the reverse with my copy of uh, Stellar Conquest. I have the Avalon Hill rules inside the metagaming box. I'm not sure which way I feel about that with these. <sighs> Overall, I think I liked the Avalon Hill rules better. I like the presentation of the SPI rules, but uh, I never play with it by the SPI rules. So what we're going to see is kind of a bastardization of the rules. That's okay. I have most of them right. Uh, or close enough, um, but there is still a problem that I think existed in both rule sets, and we're going to touch on that, and I haven't come to my solution on it yet for this playing. It's one I'm aware of, and don't know how I dealt with other times. Okay, uh, now the reason I'm covering this game it's not just because I kind of like it and kind of wanted to play it. There were other things that maybe I would have done on this weekend. Uh, to play, but it also has a fairly high rating in terms of thumbs on my request list. And yeah. if you don't know about my request list, you should hunt that down. It's over on Board Game Geek, linked by linked on the main uh, games list uh, that I have. Okay, let us talk about this. So the base idea of this game is, and if you remember my uh, Europa Universalis, it was, this was one of the games upon which that was based. The base idea of this game is, hey, you're the Europeans coming over and, you know, you're going to start colonizing and exploring and even fighting a little bit, although maybe more than a little in some cases, over the New World. Okay. So... What we have on the board is a number of different things. First of all, we have these regions, which are essentially going to be treated as economic regions. And they have a number of different values on them. These are, uh, I don't remember which one's which, uh, the number of natives and the attrition level of the province. Okay. This is the distance from Europe uh, in something called bounds. And what else do we have? In some territories, it says R2 at the end. That means it's a rich province and farming activities there will be doubled. Um, you also have some terrain there. Basically, you have your clear, you have your jungles, you have your kind of mountainous rough. You actually have mountains which are impassable. Um, you have these little stars which are going to be where these cities go. They'll be... So there's two ways to play. One is these cities are randomly play... Uh, are uh, preset. But another is these get shaken up and placed in various places and not just where they are historically um, acceptable. I seem to remember there being special rules in the Avalon Hill version for Potosi, but I cannot find any So in this rule set, so I'm just going to leave it alone. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, Lots and lots of charts, which we'll kind of touch on as we hit them. Tracks to keep your money on, which I have them all sorted in the first spot, but they should be spread out among them. Turn record track, which has a lot of words on it. Those words are the names of explorers and other important people as they come into play and as they historically would die. I've left a couple of pieces off the board. These are ones that I don't think I'm going to use. This one is uh, Sebastian Cabot. If you're playing without the Portuguese player, if you play this in the three-player game, Cabot is always English. If you play it in the four-player game, Cabot becomes Portuguese for most of his career. Okay. Uh, 
Each country has its own little home area. The counters, we have a number of different things. These are just money. Uh, these are to indicate when gold mines are depleted or abandoned. Ships that you can purchase and use to transport stuff, obviously. And these are your main country counters here. Uh, we got colonists in various denominations up to five. We've got military units, which come with a multiplier of how many units there are. So this is one military unit with a strength of four, and then two of them would then have a strength of eight. The movement point allowance is next door. The colonists work the same way. This is one colonist. He has a strength of one with a uh, movement allowance of four. We've got a bunch of missionaries here. These are a special rule that apply only to the Spaniards. And you see something sad here, different types, these glossier ones. What happened was, very early on, I mean, I was still in uh, high school, um, early high school because I had certain friends there. I went to a friend's house with the game. It, I very seldomly do this ever. <laughs> I don't have any friends. But, no, I very seldomly end up uh, uh, transporting my games much anymore. But I went to a friend's house, and, you know, this was one of my earlier games. Not real early, but... Uh, I was really proud and happy of it. I played it solo maybe once or twice. And we used cups, like I'm using this, to pick the missionaries from. And his grandma, yeah, they, they were alone in the apartment or house for, well, it was an apartment, uh, until, uh, you know, for the weekend at least. But their grandmother came in and did the dishes. <laughs> and she ends up soaking my chip cup with all the chits in it just you know didn't even think a coffee cup wouldn't be used for food or anything like that it was just sort of a sad situation anyway worked out okay except that i can kind of feel which counters are which all right i seem to be delaying getting to the rolls it feels like but let's take a shot at them i've skimmed them well i've read them but I don't think I've really absorbed them. It's a game I knew long, long ago, though, so we'll see. Let's look uh, first using the sequence of play, and I'll, I'll try to fill in where I can, what I can. So the first thing is this council phase, and I don't know if there's a copy of the sequence of play here. Usually, I think my ex-wife and I played this, and usually she makes a little sequence of play card. When we do, but I don't see one. You also see there's these expedition logs. I got some photocopies here. These are going to cover information on your monarch, uh, anything you discover, and then you kind of plot out where your expeditions are going. You keep track of uh, the native levels. Those can, of course, just decrease as the game goes, as they historically did. And then you got a little uh, information on what you can purchase, uh, what the costs of different things you can purchase are. All right. Let's jump back um, onto the council phase. This is going to start off with, e uh, with each player rolling for three things. Taxation, availability of colonists, and political events. And here I may be tweaking the SPI rules. I vaguely remember the Avalon Hill rules being a little different here. Um, the main part of this, let's see if we can find it, is the random events table over here. Yeah, there quick jump. Um, you roll a die, based on your monarch rating, you get a certain, um, and A is the best, you get a certain amount of money, and that's just money given to you. Now money is important for the end of the game victory points, so that's kind of a deal. You also get a certain number of col colum colonists, not columnists, uh, so the more money you get, the less colonists you get, and the more colonists you get, the less money you get to invest. And that kind of makes a neat little balance. And then you roll a second die, and compare it to your first, and this is where I was thinking, but I, I don't think it is. I think I always played it this way. Um, and I think this is what the rules always were. So I'll leave it alone. Uh, the second die roll cross-references, and it gives you a random event by number, or a letter which indicates that your monarch has just changed to that rating. Your monarch died and you have another type of monarch. There's a list of all the different political events here. Um, they don't exactly match the numbers in the SPI rulebook. 
but they're easily transferable. I think there were a couple that maybe needed to be corrected, actually. Whatever. We'll handle it as it comes. All right. Um, then you determine who goes first in a segment uh, for, the, for the rest of the t segments in the turn. And that is done... Uh, you multiply the amount of money you have by the type of monarch you are. So if you're an A monarch, you multiply your money by four. And whoever gets the highest rating will be going first. Now, there may be some advantages to not going first, but in general, going first is a good thing in this game. Because if you get to a discovery first, you find it first. Um, Then we go to the planning segment, and at this point you can purchase new stuff using your money in Europe. And you also set out uh, any expeditions, and you write down who's going where with what. I may be a little loose on this and not fill it all out as carefully as I would in an opposed game. Uh, I seem to remember that I used to just scratch these down pretty lightly when I'm soloing. Okay, now this is going to be made up of a number of things. The, there's basically going to be three movement rounds. An, ocean, an oceanic movement round, a hemispheric movement round, and then a second oceanic movement round where you return to Europe usually. Okay. So what you do is you record what hex a particular expedition that you create is going to go to. Now, when you create an expedition, you have to load up your ships with stuff they can carry. These guys can carry... Uh, I don't remember what. Yeah, they don't have it there. These guys can carry like one military or one colonist, if I recall correctly. And these guys can carry two. They also can carry gold. I don't know the specifics of it, and I don't want to try to look it up if it's not kicking around where I can see it. I'll remember it later, and we'll catch it during the play. It's really not that important. Uh, to the overall feel of the game. Uh, hemispheric movement, this you don't plot. So the oceanic movement, you plot which hex you're going to go to. Hemispheric movement, you say, well, I've got some stuff once I get to the new world I want to do. I want to sail around, I want to explore, I want to discover, uh, maybe I want to fight. You've got to kind of guess how much movement points you're going to use there. Okay, so these are both going to be recorded in something called bounds. Now, the number here, in the brackets, is how many bounds it costs to get to that area, to get to a hex in that area. So if I wanted to sail to here, hex 2314, I would have to buy three bounds. Bounds are going to cost two ducats each. Well, it would cost me six bucks to get there. Now, if I want to move around using the hemispheric movement, every eight movement points is going to cost me a bound. Okay. Now you can exceed the amount of bounds you you purchase, but at the very least, it's in bad form to like deliberately do that. Uh, it may not be a good idea, but I'm not sure. I seem to remember times when you want to exceed the bounds that you purchased on purpose, like you want to save money that way. And that disturbs me. Um, I'm not going to be playing with this sort of, oh, I must win at all costs. I think this game can be uh, kind of mangled in a lot of ways if people are uh, intent on doing so. But as a game, if you just play it kind of naturally and don't worry too much about trying to play, well, as an experience, if you don't worry too much about trying to game it, it works out pretty well. Um, all right, where are we? Okay, so... If I wanted to sail here and then do some other things, and as far as I can see from the rules, that includes exploring this hex so that I could land on it, uh, landing troops on it, whatever. Those things cost hemispheric movement. So you never go anywhere without expending at least one hemispheric movement. I may fiddle with that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I would, I, I would have to be expecting to spend four bounds to get there even in general. Okay. Um.
Then all those plat plotted movements, they're taken care of by transoceanic naval movement. People sail to the hex they're supposed to be at. Okay? They don't roll attrition yet. That comes later. Then they do hemispheric movement, and this is important to do in player order because it's not plotted. So the first person is allowed to expend the bounds that he spent here, or to go over that expenditure if an opportunity arises, um, to move as much as he wants, really. Now, different things cost when you're moving navally, but for the most part, if my, I recall correctly, hex to hex costs you one movement point. If you want to do something in a hex, that includes landing in your own port, which I kind of disagree with, landing, uh, assaulting an enemy port, landing on, uh, on a coast with new stuff, whatever, it all, uh, fighting an enemy, it all costs like three movement points, if I recall correctly. I'll look that up. Yeah. So now, I seem to remember that ports should give you a bonus. So, I make it free to land at your own port. You don't have to pay anything if you've got a port established. And we'll explain that in a moment, but, well, a port established is pretty simple. It's, you have a colonist on the coast. That's good enough. Okay. Uh, where are we? Okay. So, during this hemispheric naval uh, movement phase, you can attack your enemies, and that's handled fairly simply. We'll get to that in a moment. They can also intercept you. They have like a 50-50 chance if you choose not to attack them. Otherwise, you can just move on or stay with them. Uh, what you cannot do is you cannot attack an enemy port, and that's done by landing troops, if they have ships there. So you have to drive their ships off. Well, you're only allowed to attack each each enemy stack once. So unless you win the naval battle, you're not going to be able to perform the naval landing there. For whatever that matters. Which isn't a lot, to be honest. Because the way the game plays out, you can do a naval invasion next to where you want to attack. Say uh, you wanted to attack somebody here. You could land here and attack. And that's where this is starting. That's where some interesting little bits are starting to come together. I want to get into that in a little bit. Uh, some of the rules changes that I'm going to make. Okay. Um, okay. After you've done all your oceanic movement and then your hemispheric movement, you've collected up a certain number of bounds of movement that you've uh, done. And that's where we have to find the attrition table. There it is. Uh, essentially, you add up the number of bounds you made, you roll a die, and you take some damage. And that damage could be a lot. <laughs> it's expressed in um, numbers of colonists, soldiers, and ships that you have to lose. If there's an asterisk, you end up, which happens on a natural one, you end up losing a leader who's present, a conquistador or explorer. Um, okay. If you end up not having enough bounds paid for to travel the whole distance you're going to go, you roll on the nine or more table. If you happen to be in a position where you'd roll on the nine or more table, and you don't have enough bounds, you roll on it twice, which, as you can see, is a dangerous aspect. Now, there's one special thing. If you do circumnavigation, you roll on that multiple times, I think, on the nine or more table. I don't remember what the total is. It's tough. Um, unlike in Europa Universalis, explorers are not better than any other, except in terms of how long they stay on the board. You don't have... Uh, Columbus can circumnavigate, or, you know, Columbus could circumnavigate, or Magellan can circumnavigate, but I wouldn't want to try it with, oh, I don't know, Vespucci, who, strangely enough, appears to be Portuguese in this, although he sailed for France. Didn't he? I don't know. I don't remember. Okay. 
No, I'm thinking of Arizona. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Uh, all those damn Italians sailing other people's boats. So, after you do that attrition step, now you go to the gold segment. And if you're in a gold hex, one of these little treasure markers, you make a die roll to see if you can find it. Now that die roll depends on whether it's mainland gold or Caribbean gold. The two are going to be treated a little differently. Uh, mainland gold, in order to discover it, you have to roll a one or a two on one die. Caribbean gold, you have to roll a one through four. Mainland gold is going to produce 25 gold per mining uh, aspect. Caribbean gold is only going to produce 15. And whenever you produce, they're um, depleted at different values, I think. Caribbean depletes on a 1 or a 2 each time. Mainland, I think, is like a 2 or 11. Yeah, 2 or 11 on the die roll. Now, after you discover gold, or if you already have gold discovered, if you have any colonists in that hex, they can grab the gold, and they take the gold from the mine, uh, from the mine at the rates indicated, and then you check to see if you depleted it. If you only have soldiers there, you can still discover the gold, but you can't mine it. You need to get a colonist there to mine it, and you end up just putting an abandoned gold mine there. Um, land movement and combat. Then again, in initiative order, each player gets to move his units, and every hex costs one movement point. You want to end your movement in a nice place because there's this land attrition table. And we'll get to that in a moment. But just keep that in mind that that can be a problem. You don't spend attrition for your movement itself, though. And this is a Berg game. Why didn't it use the Crusades uh, system? He seems to have fallen back into touch with that at some point. Um, while you're moving... You can attack enemy stacks, and those are handled, you know, I didn't handle naval uh, combat. Those are handled through a simple odds ratio. Uh, I don't think a conquistador helps you there. Let's jump back to the naval combat. Again, that's handled through a simple odds ratio. But the difference there is uh, there's a possibility to capture a prize. And certain guys, the English... Uh, privateers, sea dogs, whatever, will capture all their ships as prizes. Now, they have some special rules. They have to arm all their ships with troops, so they've got some weird little aspects if they're operating as privateers. Okay, um, then you're allowed to do native combat in an area. If you do native combat in an area, you count up the number of soldier detachments you have, and you roll a die, and that's how much uh, you reduce the native level. Now, as a modifier, you get a bonus for conquistadors and for certain missionaries, plus value missionaries. Now, missionaries are going to have one of two numbers on them. Only Spain gets these. The plus value ones are very violent, and they help you wipe out natives. The minus value ones are peaceful, and they help you keep the natives calm. They think you're only allowed one in an area. Um, okay. After you attack the natives, then there's a possibility of a native uprising in every area that you've got people. So there's going to be a lot of die rolling and a lot of fiddly little stuff going on in here. And you roll here, it's based on the number of soldiers in the area. Uh, the more soldiers you have in an area, the better this is. Now let's see, if there are natives, the total number of natives is added to the number of colonists in the player in the area. The rating of a missionary is added or subtracted to this total. From this total is subtracted the number of soldier detachments. The result is the uprising level. 
Now roll the die. If you roll less than the uprising level, then you have to check on here. So here's the deal. If you've got a presence there, you uh, count up your number of um, uh, colonists, add it to the native uprising value, the native level. So for example, here in the Caribbean, that's a three. And subtract any soldiers you have and also affected by the missionary. So there's a chance there's a good chance there's you don't have to roll on this table. You keep a decent number of soldiers from uh, colonists. But as you begin to colonize an area, it becomes very difficult to keep enough soldiers in the area uh, to protect it. So you do want to wipe out the natives as you go. All right, I'm going to split this one. Phew. Okay. After natives, we have the land attrition. And this is based on this adjusted attrition level. Now that's going to be calculated based on the attrition of the area you're in, plus certain modifiers, and I'm trying to see if there's a list of them somewhere here. I do not see them. I seem to remember them being... somewhere... Uh, other than in the rules. I can kind of... I don't really remember them off the top of my head, so I'm going to have to kind of peek them out. Uh, yeah, okay, forest and jungle add one. That's the green. Rough adds two to your total attrition. Coastal island or a river, including a great lake, uh, subtracts one. And... Uh, Conquistador has an effect. I don't remember if it's a bonus. I think it's a die roll bonus. So what you do is if your attrition level is at least one, and maybe even if it isn't, maybe even if it's zero, I don't know if that's possible anywhere. Attrition is the second number. This would be two. Here it's one. It would go down to zero. I think you still roll in that case. You roll on this table, and basically that's what you lose. Uh, like a colonist, a soldier, a colonist and a soldier, two of them, everybody. Um, oh, that's what it is. Conquistadors, the rules say subtract one, but that would be bad. Uh, re reduce your chances. They add one, and that apparently is both rule books. They add one to your die roll, which is kind of weird. So if you're in a one, you will not suffer with a conquistador. All right. And I already mentioned, I think, the conquistadors count in the uh, combat against natives as well. And there, they subtract one. So they're going to make it much more likely that you're going to wipe out natives. Okay. Uh, okay, at this point, you can uh, gather resources. Gold that you picked up is able to be transported during your movement, during your land movement. I think it's up to eight hexes to a port. The one exception to that is Cusco is allowed to transport to anywhere. That gold can be seized from land convoys, etc. Uh, that gold can be taken from settlements. Your enemy can grab it and carry it, cart it off somewhere. Someone could sail up during the oceanic uh, phase, sack your port, grab your gold, and, and, and dump it on their ship and leave. If you've got it sitting around too long, which is generally not a good idea. But during the return home segment that's coming up, you will be able to sail that gold home from a port. Um, let me think how I want to say this. All right. Yeah, so the gold that you transported to a port can then be shipped back home, and it'll be recorded on your tracks at that point. Gold has to be carted home. But at the same time during the resource segment, you collect your resource for your colonists. Now what colonists are going to do is they basically produce 
one resource point for just existing. Now there was a maintenance phase and I gotta find that. That's coming up. Um, each colonist up to five in a hex produces a resource point. Okay. If there are uh, if there's an R2 in the area, you double that value. Okay, now colonists are going to cost two maintenance points each. So right there you're going to begin to say, wow, the best they can do is break even when you first start playing. And that's true. Colonists do not bring you money early in the game. However, there's this R level. And once the R level gets up to two, it's doubled everywhere. And if it's already doubled, well, it's doubled and doubled again. And that R level continues to increase up to R5. Now, one of the biggest goals in this game is collecting money. So, optimizing your colonization plan is really important. And you have to, to do that, you have to take into mind where your explorers are and when they are. Because you can't just sail anywhere and drop people off. In order to land on uh, a, a controlled location, uh, an unknown location, a location that you do not have colonists in, essentially, um, you need to have an explorer present. Now that covers, this is where the trick comes. That includes enemy ports, attacking an enemy port. This game only goes till 1600. Knowledge was limited at that point of where the enemy was. But it wasn't completely gone. Uh, EU handles this by saying, okay, look, you've explored and you know he's got a port there. You can go there now, right? They also allowed exploration without a leader. Uh, to a limited extent at one point, but not by 1600. The question that comes up here is, how do I reflect that? Because the rules as written say you can only land if you have uh, uh, a navigator. Well, that's where the problem with Persone comes in. He's nobody. He's some French... He's a French navigator who's put in to give the French a little bit of balance. But you know what? The Portuguese have no balance at all. All their navigators end here. They are no longer going to be able to explore after a certain point of the game, which is kind of historical as well, because you have uh, uh, the Union of Spain and Portugal, which exists in the three-player game when you're playing Portugal as a minor power, but it doesn't really work in the four-player game. And I'm kind of debating maybe it should never be played in four. Uh, <laughs> there's also five player roles for playing the German banks, which is about as exciting as playing the Fed in uh, after the Holocaust. It's simply not something that you know you want to do, but it may or Belgium and Pax Britannica. It's not something you really want to do, but you know what? You got the extra player and you decided you were going to play this. Fine, we've got room for you. You'll sit in as the German bankers. They're kind of lame rules. All right. So I'm still debating in my head whether or not to somehow allow a means of recording. Hey, we know where that is. We know where you went. I don't know if I can think of a way within this game, and I'm just going to maybe write it off as one of the flaws. I don't like the idea of adding Persson, though. The French did not really exercise a lot of... Uh, during the period that we're talking about, uh, turn 17 to 19, the end of the game, when you can grab points, the French did not really exercise a whole lot of colonial dynamism. They did not go off at conquering colonies too much in that area of other people. They weren't fighting Spain, though. And that's kind of the problem, is that Britain and Spain have leaders, Britain especially, because the English were at war with Spain during that era. And that kind of twists the whole game, as far as I'm concerned, because this is an important period. It's when you can take down the leader. All right. 
but I think I'll play by the rules and without this extra dude. Because I, well, alright, I'll put him in. <laughs> the reason I'm putting him in is France ought to have some ability to do this. It really sucks to not have them have any. Alright, where, where are we here? We were in the resource collection. Okay. Resources that you get from your colonists come to you for free. Now, there are some limitations. You can only collect times one resources in an area where gold is being mined, which makes mining in the Caribbean kind of questionable. Early on, it's probably worth it, but late in the game, those things don't produce a lot of money. If they're still available and haven't uh, tapped out, you probably can be producing a lot more with colonists you have there. Of course, somebody else could go in and start a gold mine. Somebody could go take Cuba from you or take this little island, start a gold mine, and ruin it for everyone. And that's kind of cool, too. Um, all right. Then we go to a transoceanic naval segment. Now, again, you had to buy these bounds. You plotted for them in your return movement here. You don't have to, but it's suggested. Uh, and you sail back from where you were, and you get another attrition roll uh, on the naval attrition table based on the bounds that you sailed there. At this point, any territories you discovered, and discovery is an important part of the game, we'll touch on that, I guess. Uh, any territories you discovered, you get credit for. Here's the discovery table. And yeah, here's circumnavigation. It's going to be 30 bounds. You have to pay for it, and you roll twice on the nine or more column. Now, 30 bounds is 60 bucks. That's 120 victory points. You get 175 victory points for it. It's not a big payoff, but it's kind of neat. Um, and on top of whatever you paid for it, you've got to send your ships there. You've got to build ships. So it's kind of a weird little maneuver here. But some of these things, for example, first person to discover North America gets 35 points. That's just landing on, spending the exploration points to do that. And that's the same with all of these others. Um, there is a land expedition, a couple of them. Mississippi and Amazon River, you basically have to traverse down the entire uh, river basin and you get a pile of points for that. That's a fairly cheap one to do. Because, really, you know, if you've got the troops in the area to do it, all you have to do is worry about attrition. <coughs> and you don't want to use colonists for that just because they're so slow. Okay. Where are we? Whatever gold comes back to Europe uh, goes to national treasuries. I didn't explain something which is these little stars. I vaguely did about these. These are going to produce money for you on the gold table here. So, oh, here's the summary of all the gold table stuff. So, Tetnochilin, Chitnitsa, and Cusco. Well, they all deplete on a two through five. They're automatically discovered. You can start pillaging them once you've wiped out the natives in the area. And they produce different amounts of money. Instead of having those fixed, I'm gonna use these little stars. They get shaken up at a cup and put in a number of places. The ones that are on the map are some of those little places, but there are others. There are also events that make you go chase additional cities that don't even exist. That you know don't exist. Um, okay. And those are treated kind of like gold mines, <coughs> except they have a higher payoff and they deplete more easily. Big difference, you can only loot with soldiers. You cannot do so with colonists. And they also don't affect the production value of the territory. Um... Now you go to the maintenance phase, and you have to pay the maintenance for all units. Maintenance is listed here. Key to this, colonists are two bucks each. That means early in the game, your colonists are just going to be able to break even in the best territories. Later on, of course, they make more money. Regular units, uh, soldiers cost money. Missionaries cost money to maintain. They didn't cost you anything to build. You can send one out with a mission, but everywhere where there's a colony, though, Spain has to maintain a mission, and if they fail, if they lose their missionary, they have to ensure that they get one there. I don't remember what the penalties are, but they have to. It's specific. I didn't touch galleon fleets. Galleon fleets 
are basically impervious. They can sail to a port, thereby protecting it from being attacked. They can carry an unlimited amount of gold, and they can't be attacked. But you must buy all bounds for them. They cannot go around the Cape, and I don't know what else to say. The Cape has to be discovered in order to travel through it. There's a bit of a risk to that. Let's see what else we're missing here. Political control of areas. The other way to get victory points, other than money at the end of the game and discovery points, is this political control of an area. You need four requirements, or you need the following requirements uh, to control an area. You need 50% of the colonists in the area, 75% of the soldiers, no enemy ports, and you have to have at least one friendly port, unless there aren't ports. Uh, spaces there, and at least three friendly colonists in two friendly settlements. Okay, if you meet all of those, you control the area, which is worth a tremendous 150 victory points. Okay, that's big, <coughs> and that's why you might want to colonize early is to establish yourself and build. You'll get two points for uh, gold, 150 for each area, and then your discoveries. So you've got a lot of different options as you enter the game, what you want to go for. You could conceivably say, you know, I don't want to play the colonization game at all. I am just going to make money off by taxes each turn and stow it away, and I'm not going to play. And that is what the German bankers do. <laughs> uh, they're basically enforced to do that. Speaking of which, we have these guys. What I'm going to do with them, I'm not going to be playing with the German bankers as a player. These are available for bid. Essentially, everybody puts in... Uh... Oh, I don't remember if it was a sealed bid or not. I seem to remember it was... Uh... Yeah, I'm going to go with a sealed bid. I don't have that rule here. That was in the Avalon Hill rules. Um, you put a sealed bid in on them, and whoever wins it gets to use that explorer for the rest of its life. Uh, or, or no, for that turn. For that turn. And then he comes back and is for auction again for the next turn. That's kind of what I would think Cabot should be. And actually, a number of these early ones... Um, However you want to look at it, that, though, they decided to assign the mercenary Italian uh, the explorers, but not the mercenary uh, German ones. I don't know. Um, there's solo rules, which kind of automatically handle some of the countries. There's special... S the base game suggests that Portugal be handled as a, a random power. And I... I'm tempted to do that because it feels more historical to do it that way. So you know what? I'm going to I'm going to do that. I'm going to only play a three player game and I'm going to have Portugal run by the uh, by the random rolls which essentially has them do kind of random colonization. This is kind of like in um, Pax Britannica. Um, and let's see. Well, that's the Treaty of Tortosalus. There's a native level. No, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'm just going to play Portugal as the fourth player. Because I have the counter. They weren't, they weren't meant to be a player in the original SPI, and I, I think that's actually a better situation, but they're handled as a native level in Brazil and eventually swing over uh, through annexation. 
and I would rather play him as a player. I'll let the Spaniards take them over because to tell you the truth, even when Portugal was part of the Spanish crown, Brazil was not entirely accepting of that. In fact, that's where the revolution essentially persisted and stayed. Okay, so that's how we're going to do it. We're going to do the four-player game, and we'll kick this off. A uh, brief word about balance and such not. I've already kind of talked a little bit about it when we were discussing Persona. Well, obviously the Portuguese don't grow after this. They don't get any additional leaders. Uh, that makes it much harder for them. They can only colonize in their one area. This is not a balanced game. Spain has huge, huge amounts of great, you know, of conquistadors, missionaries. They have all these little bonuses that they can use. And lots and lots of uh, leaders available. And that's their big advantage. England has these privateers, and they have decent leaders towards the end of the game, which allows them to kind of seize power later on. Is it historical? No, you're going to see some very ahistorical stuff happening, perhaps, like English colonizing early, very early, when they should only be coming down around here. Um, the French, well, even with Person, they don't have much ability uh, to expand their zone of influence at the end of the game. And Portugal has none. Such is life. Uh, all right. Well, we'll kick this off and get it started. I think I gotta go shopping first, though.